This week on the It's a Monkey podcast. Every single industry across the board, a lot of human workers are going to be replaced by um, artificial intelligence and robots and, and just more efficient processes and more efficient way of doing things. And a, a lot of those people need to be training in the skills that will matter in that economy. Our future economy is much, much more digital than our current one. So uh, we really need to be training people for that. And there's definitely a current shortage. In the United States alone, there's a standing demand for over 300,000 developers right now. There's at least 90,000 JavaScript jobs alone paying more than $100,000 a year that are not being filled right now. Thank you for listening to the It's a Monkey podcast. We are taking a couple of weeks break over the Easter holiday in Australia. We'll be back in a week or two with some live podcasts. But in the meantime, we're going to be playing you some fantastic repeat shows of previous podcasts that we know you will enjoy. Thank you for listening to the It's a Monkey podcast. You're back with the It's a Monkey podcast. My name is Kevin Garber. We talk about everything relating to tech, the tech economy, startups on the show. And as most of you know, I built a little company called Manage Flitter, which has over 3 million users. And one of the big, if not the biggest challenge um, in my job is finding uh, the right people to join us for uh, this crazy startup journey. And um, one of my team members the other day actually uh, sent me this article called How to Build a High Velocity Development Team, Be the Quantum Leap. And it's an absolutely fantastic article. If you're a, um, a, a startup entrepreneur, if you want to be a startup entrepreneur, even if you're a developer, this article really captures the challenge, the difficulty, the various aspects of building a uh, and the challenges of building a, a development team. And I'm happy to say I managed to track down the author, who's uh, Eric Elliott, who's the founder of Parallel Drive, which uh, teaches um, and, and trains people up in JavaScript. But uh, Eric's also worked at places like Adobe, etc. So Eric, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. So what was your initial motivation to put together this uh, fantastic extensive article about um, building high velocity development teams? So I think uh, most of it just came from frustrations that I've had over many years in the industry. And uh, I just kind of wanted to help teams avoid these problems that crop up again and again in just about every project I've ever seen. So um, I took a stab at trying to condense all of my um, my dev leadership experience into a, a single blog post, and uh, hopefully, I, I got enough in there to be valuable. And you um, certainly state pretty early in the article. Nothing predicts business outcomes better than an exceptional team. If you're going to beat the odds, you need to invest here first. And I know it's a cliche, people talk about the team, but it's really, um, I mean, that statement is absolutely 100% true. It is all about the people and nothing but the people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's not just having the right people, that's a big part of it. Um, but it's also figuring out the right team dynamic um, putting them in an environment where they can work well together and mesh as a team is really important too. So, um, and that's a process that I think it gets overlooked a lot. And I think the primarily like the biggest factor is that companies tend to undervalue their developers in, in a big way and try to treat them all the same, like they're all cogs in a machine. And I really want to stress, no, like when you hire a developer, that developer represents about a million dollars per year in value if you're a good company, right? So you don't want to treat them um, poorly. You want, to, you want to set them up to succeed in your company. And developers are really interesting people. I mean, I'm a, a, a tech-oriented uh, CEO, but I'm not actually a developer per se. I really, really enjoy working with developers. I find them, I find, I find the way they see the world is quite... Um, quite different and I, I hope that doesn't come come across as patronizing to any developers but I really really enjoy working with developers they seem to be really um, 
have have a couple of extra processes around, uh, so to speak, around um, you, you know the way they see certain things, and they on the flip side, I think they are certainly quite different to manage than than non-developers you know developers a lot of the time you know the information is very much um, to communication is very much information exchange for example so a lot of people get frustrated if they've never worked with developers before they don't understand why developers don't like small talk for instance generally you know, I'm generalizing here, you know, but to a lot of developers, you know, communication is just information exchange. It's, it's not small talk. Also, developers don't tend to, tend to enjoy um, negotiating and things like that. They like the best offers up front and fairness. And so they quite, if people are going to, you know, uh, need to manage or build development teams, they really need to understand all these nuances to, to managing developers. Yeah. And I think that there's there's really a lot of different types of developers. And as as we expand the tech education and things like that, we're going to start reaching a, a much broader um, type of in, individual who's attracted to the field. And and, and and matter of fact, I think that as time goes on, more and more every field will kind of become a developer's field. So um, in terms of like developer typecasting, I think a lot of that is going to start to evaporate a little bit, but uh, it's really good to understand that developers, uh, what they do every day is they practice, uh, they practice logic, and uh, when you do that all of the time, your brain kind of gets stuck in that mode, right? So, um, for instance, when you interrupt a developer who's deep in thought, they might be a little bit cranky, but that's because it takes them about 20 minutes to sink back into the deep thoughts that they were thinking about. So um, I, I think just being aware of those types of things that developers are very interested in, in facts and everything is like uh, quantitative and uh, there's empirical evidence for everything when you're, when you're talking about things. Uh, like if a designer says, hey, we should change that button color, and the developer probably is thinking, well, no, we should A, B test it and see what the data says. So, yeah, it's, it's important to understand things like that about developers. And, you've, and you're very, um, you, you really push for collaboration amongst developers as well. Oh, absolutely. So one of the big problems in the industry is that there's a very wide range of skill sets and there's so much to learn about development that no one developer can learn everything they need to know. So what's really important is that developers have the means of communicating with each other easily without interrupting each other constantly. So uh, asynchronous communication like online chats tend to work really well for developers versus like a lot of people are used to working in an office together and they just walk over to their, their neighbor across the aisle at, and start talking to them with developers. That's probably not the best idea because uh, that interruption is going to cost the business a lot of money. First of all, because when you interrupt a developer, like I said, it, it can take them like twenty minutes to sink back into the problem. So asynchronous, like chatting and communication that way, or uh, emails rather than going and interrupting them, is probably the best way to get them collaborating well. And there's also uh, things like GitHub that. Uh, that let developers review each other's code using pull requests and and they can make comments on the code changes that some other developer made so if they could catch mistakes or they perhaps know a better way of doing something and there are opportunities to educate but there's also it works the other way some developers uh, will have a lot to teach uh, the more experienced developers will have a lot of wisdom around like how they think about code and so Exposing junior developers to um, to the great code of a senior developer who's got a lot of experience is very valuable too. So, uh, yeah, definitely collaboration is essential when you're working with developers. And let's talk about this. You you address the issue of languages, you know, and obviously there's um, and there's all sorts of languages in our in our industry. And um, I mean, we like to take the attitude that smart developers can you know, switch and change and learn, um, you know, development um, languages as they need to. You're very bullish on, on JavaScript. Um, talk us through why that is and, and why you feel that 
Um, I mean, do you feel that, um, you know, a, a language agnostic attitude is, is, is best or, or developers should perhaps focus on certain languages? Talk us through a little bit um, on, your, on your thoughts on that. So firstly, I think it's wise to, to agree that developers really can pick up just about any language and learn how to be productive in it. So that's very true. And it's also very wise for developers to do that. Different languages uh, have different ways of thinking about problems. Uh, they kind of force you to think differently about pr the same problems. So being able to go into a different language and just see a completely different angle and a completely different approach to problem solving is extremely valuable in and of itself. So I would encourage a developer to uh, at least the junior developers who are just getting started, um, you know, every every year or year and a half or so, go ahead and like take uh, take your spare time and learn uh, learn another language and just get at least conversant in it. Get good enough that you can write uh, simple programs. So a lot of the people that are the most successful are have gone really really deep in a certain area. And I think that that's extremely valuable as well. Um, and in terms of a specific language for your application stack, I, I strongly believe that all of your web properties should be uh, written in JavaScript. And the reason for that is that JavaScript is the only universal language, which means that uh, it's another word for that is isomorphic, which means that it's the only language that runs natively in the browsers. It's also the only language that you can code in one language and you can have uh, the same application, not just like the same libraries or things like that, but the same application running on the server and in all of your clients, including mobile and browsers. So um, I think that the impact of that is dramatically underappreciated in the industry. Uh, and, and, you know, I really think companies can save about half of their development time uh, or you know 50 or 60 percent even of their development time just by picking JavaScript uh, and another great thing about JavaScript is that it's the most popular language in the world which means there are the most developers writing for it which means there are the most solutions that are already finished that you can that are open source and you can incorporate into your projects but it also means that it's easier to hire for because there are a lot more people that know the language. So um, definitely JavaScript, <laughs> check it out. Do you, and, and Eric, do you feel, I mean, uh, you know, um, in our little neck of the woods, there seems in Australia, there seems to be a real skills crunch in developers, I believe in Silicon Valley and other parts of the US there's as well. Long term, I mean, do you see um, a problem that, that there's not a diversity of people getting attracted to the industry? Does it still have a perception issue or, or is it just because I'm a, I'm a CEO uh, on, on, on the one side of the table so it always seems like there's a shortage of candidates? Is there actually a shortage of candidates and, and are enough people being attracted to this industry? There is certainly a shortage of candidates and one of the problems is that we're just not teaching it like we should. I strongly believe that uh, computer programming, it's literacy, literally like our kids that are growing up in schools today, by the time they get out and they graduate into the workforce uh, in 25 years or so, there's going to be, in the United States alone, there's going to be 4 million fewer, um, fewer driving jobs, just driving vehicles because they're all going to be replaced by uh, self-driving vehicles. And, um, you know, and the jobs that get replaced, they're all going to be the programmers who design those systems and design the apps that work with those systems. And, you know, believe me, there's a whole industry of uh, commuting apps that are going to pop up for people who are just sitting in these self-driving cars with nothing to do because they don't need to pay attention to the wheel anymore. Uh, you know, those kinds of things are, are really important. There's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, not just one industry. It's every single industry across the board is going to be replaced. Uh, a lot of human workers are going to be replaced by um, artificial intelligence and robots and, and just more efficient processes and more efficient way of doing things. And a, a lot of those people need to be training in the skills 
that will matter in that economy. Our future economy is much, much more digital than our current one. So uh, we really need to be training people for that. Um, and there's definitely a current shortage. There's, uh, in the United States alone, there's, there's a standing demand for over 300,000 developers right now. Hmm. Um, there's, at least, there's at least 90,000 JavaScript jobs alone paying more than $100,000 a year that are not being filled right now. That's a standing demand. Any, just go anytime and you can search and there's 90,000 open JavaScript jobs. So, um, and that's just in the United States. You know, worldwide, it's much, much bigger. So, uh, and by that, by about 2020, this gap is going to increase uh, to about a million uh, open jobs for programmers that are not getting filled because there just isn't enough talent in the marketplace. And I think there needs to be a seismic shift in the way we look at um, literacy. And, and I, think, I think computer programming is still viewed as a, an optional subject or something to do if you're interested in maybe perhaps. But we don't treat um, arithmetic or reading or writing that way. We, you know, we don't ask the kids, well, if you don't like reading or writing, you don't have to do it. It's like, well, you just, <laughs> you, you know, and I, think, and I think code's got to be up to a certain level at least. Everyone should be able to whack up some markup or a little JavaScript app at least to that level. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I don't understand why students are forced to take statistics in high school, but they're not forced to take computer programming classes when they have the same kinds of applications, uh, you know, and things like calculus and, and trigonometry. We teach the students those things, but we don't teach them how to apply those things on computers where they're most often used in the real world. If you're getting an engineering job and you're using those kinds of techniques, you're doing some kind of programming. And it, it's ridiculous to me that we teach them how to do it on paper, but then we don't teach them how to do it in a way that's going to make sense to them and transfer to usable skills. It's like um, there's a, a, I don't remember which country it was or even which professor it was, but somebody went and and was speaking in um, South America, uh, I think it was a famous physicist, and they were talking about uh, the, the state of science education there. And they were talking about how um, the students would learn something like uh, about, you know, for instance, how light reflects off of surfaces and um, polarization and things like that. And so they're talking about this polarization filter and they, this, the the professor says, what would happen if you held this up to the window and looked through the polarization filter at the water outside? And of course, uh, a polarization filter, you know, it, it'll invert the polarization so it changes the, the way that light is perceived. It, it makes it disappear or, or appear, you know, and it, and it can, that's why we have polarized sunglasses to help us avoid things. Um, but they don't understand the connection. Like they can tell you the, the formulas, they can tell you exactly what the rules are, but then they don't understand that this has a real world application. So I think it's ridiculous that we're teaching students these things. Like a lot of people in the United States, they learn algebra, but then they have no idea how to use algebra once they leave high school. You also make uh, a point in your article about remote culture, um, working remotely. Now this is quite a quite a contentious issue. I mean, Marissa Mayer, when she um, moved into Yahoo as a CEO, I believe she, she sort of ended a policy of um, remote work. Um, there's some companies like uh, Automatic, which are the creators of the WordPress platform. They are only remote. We've, we've had a mixture of both. I mean, to be honest, um, I'm always after the right team. And if it means they're remote, I don't, I don't really care. We, to be, you know, to put it blunt, we don't have the luxury of just over calibrating things on our end if someone's smart and fits with the culture you know we, we'll make it work you make some specific uh, points about uh, remote culture and you seem to be very um, very um, in favor of it yeah absolutely so um, 
I just want to make one more point about the last topic sure. before I run, run into this. Um, I'm actually hosting a, a film called Programming Literacy, uh-huh. um, and that's being produced by JS Cheerleader on Twitter. Um, but that film is all about the need for uh, better education and getting more people into the pipeline for uh, computer training. So definitely check that out, so programmingliteracy.com. Programmingliteracy.com. Um, we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so addressing remote culture, I think um, <laughs> a lot of people have this false perception that being in an office means that you're being productive. Um, well, when you're talking about developers or even just anybody who, who has to like really concentrate on their work to get something big done, um, it's absolutely the, the opposite is true. Like if you're in in the office, chances are you're getting distracted by a conversation that your coworkers are having or you're weighing in on some API design that somebody else is responsible for or you're getting distracted by the smells coming out of the kitchen. I know in San Francisco, at least, <laughs> uh, a lot of the startups have kitchens right there in the offices. Um, and you know those distractions are tremendously costly. And, and really, a developer, if they're tackling a tough problem and not just like uh, you know correcting some copy on the website or something, uh, a developer really needs big blocks of time, like three hours of uninterrupted time to um, to just clear some of the big hurdles. And what happens in the office situations is that developers in the office don't get a chance to do that. So what they'll do is they'll come in very, very early or they'll stay very, very late so they can get that interruption free time or they'll spend their weekends clearing those hurdles. And then they're working like 60 or 80 hours a week, which is not uh, sustainable in, in the most productive way. If you're overworking your workers, the productivity will actually drop off around 40 hours a week. So, um, so the idea that the office makes people more productive is just, is just patently false. It's, it's a complete lie that we tell ourselves. Um, I think that especially developers tend to get really passionate about the, what they're working on. And you can trust them to be working on the problem that's driving them crazy while they're at home, right? And if you don't trust them, why did you hire them in the first place, you know? And <laughs> you I, think, I, th- I, think that's, I think that's the crux of it. I mean, I, th- I think it's about, about hiring right. And I think some people do genuinely enjoy, even developers enjoy being in the office and enjoy experiencing that that magic that happens when you can sit around a room or, or go for a walk together. But there's some other times where, where um, you know, even partly remote or, you know, they, they want to take a couple of days at home, et cetera, but to leave, but, but to trust them that they know what's best for productivity. Yeah, absolutely. And I, speaking of productivity, uh, one thing that a lot of, uh, a lot of managers do is they count like the number of tickets that a developer is clearing and and calling that productivity tracking. And that's not the case at all because a lot of developers, a lot of the senior developers will spend a lot of their time answering questions for junior developers or mid-level developers and mentoring them in their careers and and helping them with the the problems that they're working on. So a senior level developer's uh, impact is dramatically undercounted by those uh, by those project tracking tools, whereas a, a lower level developer who's not answering questions all the time uh, and has less experience at recognizing problems and, and common things that crop up, um, they're basically throwing a quick fix in the general direction at a problem and moving on to the next one. And, um, you know, so those kinds of things don't, don't work at all, that kind of uh, productivity, productivity monitoring. So if you really want to know whether or not your developers are being productive, you know, once a week, just ask them to demo what they did that week, you know, and, and show them show the complete code and, and what they've been working on for the week. And then you can see by their demonstration whether or not they're making enough progress. And I think it must be particularly frustrating for developers if they... Um this must be quite a common problem in non-technical companies when your managers are non-technical people and they oversimplify um, some of these metrics. 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, even even the more technical people, like uh, programmers, tend to trust numbers. If they see statistics staring at them, they they think, yes, this is real. This is representative, and they have a tendency to overlook the more human thing, the the more human aspects, the stuff that can't be easily quantified. So, and a lot of engineering managers start out as developers and programmers themselves. So they don't ever they don't ever really learn the the um, the really important soft skills that come into play when you're talking about developer productivity. And it is, I mean, being as someone who's at the other the opposite end of the table as as the CEO and sort of leading the teams. It is something that's a bit of an art and, um, you know, when to push, when to pull, when to leave it alone, when to check in, you know, and, and I think I think one of the mistakes that I've, I have seen by some friends who have businesses and, and lead technical teams as well is, is at the end of the day, you can't forget that um, these are people. You know, yeah. and, and their productivity is also going to wax and wane, and they and they got their life, and and it's and and that's okay, actually. You know, this is a marathon we in together, and as long as over the long haul we all produce something, that's okay. Absolutely, and I try to tell managers when you're talking about a, a really experienced developer, give their um, give their work more time to produce value because they're they're the ones that are mentoring your the rest of your team so they're obviously not going to make as many short term wins as even the most junior developer in the shop who might come out at, you know come out of the gate like firing right and there's there's this real value that's being injected into the company by anybody who has a lot of knowledge and willingness to share that knowledge with the rest of the staff and that that stuff is really hard to track and really hard to quantify. But you can just you can you can feel it just by uh, just by observing their interactions with the other developers and um, and by asking the other developers that work with them um, what it's like to work with them. Uh, I think a lot of the junior level developers will be ranting and raving about how much they're learning on the job because of this developer. So I think that really takes a lot of time. And I think also, um, you know, what I like about our industry as well is that it is an industry where juniors and inexperienced people can actually um, contribute a huge amount. And um, I'm always saying to the team that I'm always open to the right juniors. Um, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's unusual in our industry that a lot of, you know, quote unquote juniors have been coding since they were 12 years old or something. So in a way, they've actually had a five years experience by the time they hit the workforce. Yeah, uh, I started learning when I was really young, and I know a lot of other developers get into development through video games that they got addicted to as kids, and they just wanted to learn how to do it. So there is there are a large number of developers who started um, who really started to learn this stuff, you know, before they were ten years old even. So by the time they get to the workforce, they might have ten years of experience in the language you're hiring for. And uh, it just doesn't show on their resume. Um, but also, junior developers can be uh, tremendously good at soaking up new knowledge because they don't think they know everything. Mm. A lot of senior developers do think that they know everything. And um, they're harder to coach. And they're hard, it's harder to get them to improve. Um, and it's harder to change their mind about things. Whereas somebody who's really junior, uh, uh, a senior developer can come along and train them up in the way that you guys do things at your office um, in, in a really short time. And it's amazing how much people can learn when they're collaborating on projects. I think that that's really underestimated in classrooms even. But if you give a, a, bunch, of, a bunch of high school students laptops and say, make this game in JavaScript and then just walk away for three months. When you come back, even if none of them knew anything about JavaScript, when you come back, there's a good chance that there's going to be a JavaScript game on that laptop when you get back there, right? It's just, uh, I think it's a tremendously beneficial thing to hire those junior level developers and get the fresh blood into the system. They have new ways of thinking about things and and they can approach problems in a different way and they, they might 
they might bring something very valuable to the team that you didn't think that they would. And then, yeah, and as you mentioned, there's less rigidity. Um, you know, there's as we get older, and um, you know, I think to all of us, there's just you, you know, we, we atrophy in certain in certain ways. And and I I I always love to to bring on the um, you know grads and the new. The, the new fresh pair of eyes and and in fact I try to sort of coax out of them what the, what they're actually seeing you know because to see any any operational sort of things that don't make sense to them and and try to make it safe for them to be really honest with um, yeah. you know to, to question some of our practices and go against my own um, you know um, naturally, part of my job to be conservative in certain areas to actually push back on that and to let them refactor and rework and bring in the new tools and bring in the new technologies and not just just go down that uh, you know not go with the historical momentum yeah another great thing about junior developers is they might have really good ideas about new emerging platforms that uh, that a lot of people are starting to use that you may not be aware of um, and so you can come up with good integration ideas and things like that and and working with technology that you wouldn't have normally thought of. Like, for instance, we're coming up on a, a big augmented reality, virtual reality kind of renaissance. Um, uh, you know, in the 90s, it didn't really set in, but things are really starting to take hold in that department now. Uh, and maybe they have some really great ideas or really great experience with some technology in those areas that you haven't experimented with. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And I, well, I guess, uh, Eric, we, we're very lucky to, to work in an industry that's um, you know, really at the forefront of, of changing the world. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I wonder if um, you know, the people in business and people sitting on their Facebook apps just, just wonder, um, realize how, how the, you know, the tech geeks of, of, of various ages and various flavors are, are, are literally um, you know, building and running the platforms that's shaping the world today. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point. A, a lot of the kids coming up today, they're, they're digital natives, right? They're born into this internet-connected society with screens that, that change when you touch them and, and interaction that's a lot more, more high-touch, a lot more of a visceral experience. And they're going to view the world very differently than people like me who've been around for a lot longer. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's the challenge of moving forward is being able to adapt to those changes and the way that the way that people view the world and interact with new apps. It's always exciting when you see a baby playing with an iPhone and they just uh, swiping and swiping and swiping the screen. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that I like best is like when you see a baby trying to swipe the TV screen yes. or, or you know or trying to swipe a <laughs> magazine or a book cover and and they don't understand why it's not working. They think it's broken. Exactly. Eric, um, really been fantastic talking to you. Eric Elliott, the founder of Parallel Drive uh, for all all training JavaScript. We'll put some some show notes up and Eric is the author of a fantastic article, How to Build a High Velocity to Development Team. If you're a startup person thinking of building a tech startup, read that article. It really nails it. Eric, I really appreciate your time uh, um, joining us on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it.